Hello, and welcome to Kernels. This is Becky Heil, the Southeast District Consultant for the State Library of Iowa. Our guest today is Alexis Kurth, the Adult Services Coordinator at the Solon Public Library. Kernels is an ongoing series of short videos from the State Library of Iowa. Each installment is a small pop of professional development that gets right to the core of a library program, service, or library methodology applied in a public library setting. Kernels feature in-practice librarians discussing their work so that other in-practice librarians can learn from their experiences. Kernels are posted to the State Library of Iowa's Continuing Education YouTube channel, and there's a whole playlist of them, so be sure to check them all out. They are also cross-posted to Iowa Learns, our learning management system, so Iowa librarians can watch them there for CE credit. Just watch the video and complete the evaluation. Alexis is here today to tell us about how she launched an adult trivia in-person program, then moved it into a completely online version. She will walk you through all the steps for a successful program and provide you with templates you can use to create your own program. Alexis, take it away. Thanks, Becky. So I'm going to start off today by letting you see some of the things that we do here with a Google Slideshow. Um, like, she's, like Becky said, we started this program in person and only got to do it once before we had to move it online. So one of the, these are the things that you need to consider when you're starting a trivia um, program is the trivia questions that you have and how you're going to share them. Are you going to use a Google Slideshow, PowerPoint, Prezi, or something else? We started off as PowerPoint, and when we were working in-house, that worked really well. But as we transitioned online, PowerPoint and Zoom didn't work very well together. So we moved it over to Google Slides to help with that. Um, figuring out how you're going to do answer sheets is another thing to consider. When we did it in-house, in we did it on paper and had the teams collect the papers at the end of the round. And then as we transitioned online, we moved it to a Google Form. I've played with some other libraries and some other um, community um, events where they've done it on an honor system where they just ask you to write down your answers and keep your own score. So finding an, a good answer sheet that works for you is good. I'll show you the ones we use in just a minute. You'll of course need Zoom or a conferencing website, whichever your library already uses. I use music in the background of all of my trivia because I noticed that when you're not in the same room with people, it's a little quiet on the, the Zoom. So when we were in person, we didn't play music because we had 50 people in a room together and there was already a lot of background noise. But when you're not in a room together, having that music is, is kind of a nice um, silence breaker. Um, I also keep a sheet of things that the staff who are working are going to need to know. It's an answer sheet and a list of URLs that we're going to use with our online format. And then I always have two staff people do this with me. One is going to host and keep the trivia moving and kind of keep it at a good pace. And the other one is going to help be a scorekeeper and monitor the Zoom chat and making sure that people coming into the Zoom belong there so that you don't have any Zoom bombs or anything like that. So I'm going to go through a recent trivia that we did and just kind of tell you about how we did it and show you some of the things that, that go on. So this one was one that we did very recently. And when people jump onto the Zoom, this is what they see. Now, for our trivia, we had people register by emailing the library or signing up on our Eventzilla page. And then I would send them the Zoom link. We also, when it became closer and realized we had more open spots, just posted the Zoom link onto the, the web page for our library so that anybody that wanted to get into it could get into it. I do suggest that if you're going to post your link, that you have somebody, um, a staff person dedicated to making sure that people that come into your Zoom are people that you invited to be there. So that if you do have somebody try to Zoom on you, you have somebody who can take care of getting those people out right away. So as people come on, this is the first thing they see, and I asked them to locate the answer sheet, and I made an answer sheet on a Google Doc that I'll show you in just a minute, or I'm sorry, a Google Form that I'll show you in just a minute, but the Google Form URLs are really long. So I take that URL and change it into a tiny URL so that people can have that little thing to type in. I also then blast that into the comments on my Zoom so that they have something clickable that will take them straight to that answer sheet. 
So that's all while they're waiting. The next thing I ask is that they tell me how many people are on their team. I never limit team numbers when we do it um, online because it's hard to limit that. It's near impossible, but I wanted to have an accurate count for my sake to know how many people were there. Um, so I just asked that they put their team name and how many people are there in the chat. Then my scorekeeper takes that information and puts it into the spreadsheet that I'll show you in just a second so that that person can see the team names and the scores for each round that they've got. Then the first thing we do is go over all the rules. Now your rules are gonna be different um, based on the needs in your library, but you do want to have an answer sheet that they can locate and then make sure that your rules are very clear. We decided that we weren't gonna use breakout rooms like some of the online trivias do, though we just asked people when they registered to have a secondary method. So a lot of people will have Zoom open for their chat on one screen, and then on another screen, they've got a Facebook chat or a Google Hangout chat or um, Snapchat or something that they can communicate with each other with. And we ask them not to put any answers in the Zoom. Now for this one that we do in online, we ask for no outside resources. But when we did our, our in-person um, trivia, we allowed each team to check out five books to use as resources because this bumps our circulation of some of our books that maybe don't serve as well, but if people think they're going to be using them as resources, then they, they get to, to use some of those books. So you decide if you want them to be able to use resources or not. Um, I just go over all the rules with people as they get started. My trivia always consists of four rounds and there's 10 questions each. This has pretty consistently lasted an hour, almost exactly every single time. So it depends on how long you want your trivia to last, but I feel like an hour is a pretty good amount of time for most people. They seem to be um, happy with that. And if we drag it too much longer, it tends to be too long. Um, and all of my rounds tend to be on one theme. So I'll choose a theme and do 10 questions on that theme. I've been to other ones where they'll do 10 different themes. And so the first question in every round will be sports and the second one will be music and they change it up a little bit. I like to do it this way where I have all of them in one category and go through the whole thing. And then I remind them again, please don't put answers in the Zoom chat. It doesn't help anybody. Then we go over one about how to keep score. And this obviously is gonna change for years too, depending on how you wanna do it. And then I always remind them that if they have a question or if they feel like a question was unfair, I'm not perfect. And sometimes there's mistakes. Um, so feel free to ask in the chat. So we ask them not to use the Zoom chat to discuss answers, but you can use the Zoom chat to talk to the scorekeeper or to me, or to even talk to the other teams and to be um, social and a little silly. Sometimes they get pretty fun. I give between every question about 30 seconds for each question. And then at the end of the round, um, I have a three minute timer and I put all of the answers up on the screen and give them three minutes to discuss with their team. When you're in person, this three minutes isn't as critical as if you're social distancing and people are in different homes or different locations and they're trying to discuss it um, on a text, that, that three minutes is really critical in that, that case. This is a practice round that we did, or a round that we did last week in our library. So the first thing I have people do is remember to go to the answer sheet. And here's the URL for that. I require them that they put their team name and the title of the round in it. And then the rest of them are just 10 open questions. So I show them the question, I give them 30 seconds and move on to the next. 30 seconds, move on to the next. And we do that for all 10 questions in the round. Then as we get to the end of the round, I put all 10 questions up on there so that they have them there to reference as they're talking with their team and making sure they all um, agree on answers. When it gets to two minutes and 30 seconds, I give them a 30 second warning. To keep this time, I just have my cell phone sitting next to my computer. And if you turn it on the stopwatch function, if you use the lap time button, it tells you every 30 seconds um, that it's time to move on. And so that's been really helpful for me to be able to use that as a resource. After that 30 seconds is up, then I put up the answers. Um, 
And don't reread the question as I read the answer because that tends to get long and a little bit tedious. But especially if it's a, a weird answer like 11 herbs and spices, I remind them 11 herbs and spices was the number that Colonel Sanders put in his KFC original chicken recipe. <clears throat> And then between every round, I promote other programs that are doing. We do this for two reasons. One is because I always want to promote the other things that are happening at the library. And number two is that it gives my scorekeeper a chance to get caught up. So as, as he is catching up with that, then I move on to the next round. But as we're here, I would like to show you my score sheets. So in the Google Forums, you can create your own answer sheet. So here on this one, I make sure that you have your team name and your category as required things that they must answer. The rest of them are open answers that they can answer or not answer. And it just gives them a way to show what they know. When you send this out, this is what your patrons see. But there's another version that you can log into that shows you their responses. So it shows me that on round one, the noisy librarians wrote fast food and then they put in all of their answers for fast food. This is what the scorekeeper uses to keep track and see how many each team got correct. And then we created a spreadsheet so that you can put in the team name and how many of that team got correct during that round. And it will automatically subtotal those for you and total it for you. And then at the end, you can format it to show lowest to highest or highest to lowest through a sort. And then I'll show you who is in first, second, or third place. So that is... Some of the other things that we do are making sure that our categories are varied. So whenever I do a art category, I try to also do something that is science or athletics or making sure that they're all kind of balanced so that everybody can feel successful. One of the other things that I do um, is making sure that I am balancing different kinds of rounds so that you're covering a variety of topics. So in that, I always have a picture around where the the questions are all pictures. In this round, it was books that I had removed the title and author, and they just had to give me the name of the book. In the past, I've also done things like um, common logos for brands that you might see, or um, silhouettes of famous buildings. So picture rounds are really fun. People tend to really enjoy those. And then when you get to the end, I leave all of those pictures up for three minutes again to make sure that everybody can see them. And then at two minutes and 30 seconds, you get that 30 second warning. When that 30 seconds warning is up, you show those answers again. So making sure you have a variety of topics um, along with the picture round. I also do an audio round every time. Sometimes the audio round includes songs. Sometimes it includes video clips. Sometimes it includes um, sound effects and they have to identify the sound effect. So just putting those into your Google show um, is really helpful. The one trick on this is making sure that you have when you screen share that you have turned on your sharing your sound as well. So if you don't share the sound, they're not going to hear it, even though you can hear it. There are some other issues with this troubleshooting people who can't hear it, even when you have done that. Um, and I have a little link for that in the handout that shows some of the, the helpful tips to help solve that problem. Hmm. One of the other helpful things that I find is really great to do is before I start, I make a list of all the URLs that I might need during the, the gameplay. So I have a list of the tiny URL to get us to the answer sheet. And then I have all of the links for the programs that I shared. 
That way, as I talk about them with my patrons, I can copy and paste those into the chat and they can click right on it and it will open up in their computer and we'll be able to um, take them directly to the library webpage, directly to the program that we're talking about. So that has been really helpful for me and for my scorekeeper to see. Um, I also use um, a playlist on Spotify that has wordless music that I play through the whole thing and I leave that for patrons as well. But also if I use songs in one of the audio rounds, I make a playlist for that and copy the URL to that so that patrons also have um, that playlist to be able to see what is what is being played and be able to have access to those things. Um, and then let's go back to the trivia for a second. After we do all the rounds, I do a tiebreaker round. Tiebreakers can be really helpful um, if your trivia goers are incredibly good and you have nobody, somebody that gets them all right. Um, tiebreakers are meant to be tricky questions that have um, a number tied to them so that the closest person is the, the closest team will be the winner. So last night's was how many bathrooms are in the White House. But in previous trivias, we've done things like the largest pizza in the world was X inches long. How many pounds of cheese did they put on it? So those, those questions that have ambiguous answers that you just want to get the closest to, to be able to be the, the winner in case of a tie. In case you're wondering, the bathroom is in the White House, there's 35, which is a lot. And then we can announce the winners. Um, some things that we try to do when we work on these trivias is making sure that we have success for everybody that plays. Nobody wants to play a trivia that's really hard the whole way through and it's not fun for them. So when we do these questions, we try to make sure that we have a couple at the beginning that are easy, a couple in the middle that are a little harder, and then one or two at the end. So your 10th and 9th and 10th questions are going to be harder than the first and second questions in general. So increasing in difficulty has been really, really good thing, um, especially when there are families that play together, because then even the children can get those first and second, third questions and feel successful and have a good time. I think that is the be the biggest pieces there, Becky. Um, do you have any questions about anything? I do. Um, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions that I want to talk to you about. But before I get into to some of that, there were just a couple of things that I thought were really cool. I love the idea of using the book checkout in person. I think that's brilliant. And then to have them thinking about, well, you know, we don't know what the categories are going to be, yeah. which ones should we choose? That was fabulous. I, I love that a lot. That has been really um, fun. And um, to do kind of a similar thing with our online one, instead of having them check out books, we ask them to follow us on our social media. And then we give away freebie question and answers on our social media. Oh, so that cool. way we're getting them to um, sign up for our newsletter so that they can get that freebie question. But then they're also getting all of our other information. So that's been a really good way to transition that, that from in person to an online. That is brilliant. I absolutely love that. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that is is really cool. Um, and I really like the idea of using the music. I thought that was a really, really helpful tip. I think that that will be um, really important as people go through this. So lots and lots of really good advice here. And I really appreciate the fact that you're willing to share the templates um, that, that you've put together with, with everybody. And that will be in the handout. Um, I don't think we've talked about that yet, but Alexis has put together a handout and she'll have all that information and links to places where you can go to get um, access to, yeah. to her things. I put a whole Google Drive together that has all of the trivia that I have done so far. So I think there's six that are on there. And you can take it and remove my library logo and put your own on and use it or um, take whatever questions you like and, and use them because I feel like sharing is, is, I put too much work into it for only me to use it. So I would be glad for you to come copy it from my Google Drive and use it. Wonderful. I really, really appreciate that. Um, I had some of these questions I've shared with Alexis in advance, so she kind of knows what's coming, but here's one that she doesn't know. As you were talking about oh. using the Zoom chat, um, 
do they trash talk in the, in the Zoom chat? I was thinking a that little would be bit. way fun. There is a little bit of trash talk, and I found that it um, is mostly between library staff members that are the worst at that. <laughs> but it is, we have one team who has won like 90% of my, my trivia nights that I've done, and so other people kind of trash talk them a little bit. Um, and it's kind of fun to, to listen to the, the playful banter that happens in that. That is really cool. All right, yeah. so I, I did want to ask, um, what what made you start the adult trivia program? I know other libraries have done it, and, and so it's kind of out there. But for you at the Solon Library, what was it about this that, that you really liked? Who did you hope to attract to come to this? And what were your goals for participation? Yes, there were a couple of reasons we started. Number one was that um, there are a lot of other trivias that happen in the towns near us, but some of them are really expensive to join, like some of them $120 a night for your team to join. And so we decided that um, people clearly were enjoying it. And so we thought we would provide that. And my goal was to attract people who maybe didn't always use our library services because it was something fun to bring them into the library. Um, but I was surprised when we did it in person, the variety of people that it attracted. We had teams, I think the first time we did it, had we had nine teams of six people and they were ranging from um, like 20 something college students to um, senior citizen teams to teams that had families that had across the age spectrum. And so it was just really fun to see that there were like every age group in, and uh, demographic in our community was represented in that. And so I thought that was really cool that it was uh, an activity that brought all those people together in one room to do something together. Yeah. That's, that is cool. And I think it ties back when you're bringing in people that you haven't seen before and then getting them to sign up for the newsletter or follow you on social media. I, yeah. That is just brilliant. You, and, and even just advertising your other programs because those people who are new to the library now, um, because of this, they have an in to all the other things. I hear over and over from people, how do we let people know about the, the great things mm -hmm. that we do? This is a perfect way to do that. I really like that. So where do you get your questions from? They come from a little bit of everywhere. Um, <laughs> sometimes they are just things that I'll see in uh, social media posts and go, that's kind of a cool fact. And then I'll write a few more questions like them and do a little bit of research. But more often than not, it's me Googling trivia questions. Um, and when you sometimes when you Google trivia questions about animals, it'll pop up like a, a question answer that you can only take right there. But what I've found is that if you Google pub trivia questions and answers, then that pops up with more things like you would use in a, a trivia setting like this, instead of a push the button to answer the question like you would find on a Buzzfeed or a something like, like that. Um, so Finding them online is where I do most of it, but if I know there is a topic that's really hot right now, then I want to go and research some of those things and find facts and then write my own questions. Um, one of the things on the handout that I prepared is a Pinterest folder that is just full of Google, I'm sorry, full of trivia questions that I've collected. So questions and categories and all things trivia, and I just throw it all in that Pinterest folder and you are welcome, anybody is welcome to go grab those things too. Oh, cool, I'm gonna go look at that one. I think that sounds like fun. And that's a really great tip about using the pub trivia to, to get mm -hmm. the questions. That's that's a really helpful one because you never know what you're gonna get otherwise. And and yeah, yeah that's I wouldn't have even guessed that that would have been an issue. So that's that's really good. So what do you see or what have you seen as the differences between the in-person? You talked a little bit about that as you kind of talked about transitioning between the in-person and the virtuals. Did you have different participants? Um, are, do you think as we start opening up more, are you going to continue with both an online version and an in-person version? That's a great question. Um, I have noticed that we have lost some of our participants who came to the in-person programming um, when we moved to virtual. And part of that, I think, was the technology piece. Because when you do it virtually, there is a lot of technology. There's how to get onto the Zoom, and then how to use the Google Sheet, and how to communicate with other people who maybe aren't in your home. So one of the things that we did to help um, with that issue was that we also offered 
classes about how to use Zoom effectively. And so some of the older patrons that we had that we lost when we did that came and took the, I didn't, I say came, they online did the Zoom, how to use Zoom. Um, and we had some of those people come back and do trivia online when that happened. Um, one of the advantages of having it on social media is that you can reach people farther away. So we have patrons in our community, but then they also will call their sons and daughters, nieces and nephews, cousins, friends who are in other parts of the country and they'll send them the oh. Zoom link. And so last night when we did it, we had people in New York and people in Utah and people from all over playing together with us here in Iowa. Um, so our attendance has stayed roughly the same, but it has been different people. So we have the, the core group that comes, but then they invite people um, to play online that are farther away. So it's been approximately the same attendance, but just a different, different crowd. Um, and as we move to in-person programming, I think we'll move most of it back in the library because we get um, more of our local patrons that way. But I think maybe once a year, we'll probably still do a virtual one, um, especially until everybody is fully vaccinated and it's totally safe for every person to come back in the library. We wanna make sure that everybody who wants to participate still can. So That's probably great. doing a little bit of both. That's great. I, I love the idea of, you know, just maybe once or twice a year, you know, having that that wide reach. I, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I think that was the end of my question. So I would like to give a huge thank you to Alexis for being with us today. I am always interested in hearing how somebody put together their program. So Alexis, I really appreciate you sharing with everybody all of your knowledge and expertise on this. Um, so thank you. And I know um, your contact information will be in the Google folder somewhere so that if people do have very specific questions, you are free to um, reach out to Alexis as you as Absolutely. you move along. Thank you. So I would like to say thank you to everybody for watching. If you are watching on YouTube, please check out the links and the description in the description for more information. And if you're watching through I Will Learn, they're usually stored as attachments. So that's where you'll find the information. And if you have a little bit of time left, you can watch another kernel. If you're doing something great at your library, a program, a new initiative, a service, or something else, if you think this would be something other librarians would like to know about, I would really appreciate it if you let us know. We'd love to do a kernel with any of the rest of you out there watching. We want to hear about it, so please reach out to us. Thanks again to Alexis, and we'll see you all at another kernel.